Welcome to the Knock on Archery podcast, where we bring all archers and bow hunters together from all walks of life with the goal to educate, empower, and inspire you to be better both in the field and on the range. There we go. <laughs> What's happening, man? Good. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. So uh, this is none other than Dr. Peter Atia, dude. How, like, how famous are you now? You, your book tour was insane my, my book tour of podcasts but it was not a real tour <laughs> well i don't know you did you did uh i saw oprah was giving you a ton of love dude uh, yeah actually i guess that's that was the probably one of the the more traditional things that i did that was pretty cool so how's uh how's like your feedback from the book is there anything that you know you any like points that got across that you're just super pumped about because it was that was a passionate subject of yours yeah i think that um you know i think it i think books reach people that podcasts don't necessarily reach and even though i've been um you know podcasting for a while and have a, a great audience there and a great audience for our newsletter that are you know really regular followers of of this type of content around you know health longevity health span lifespan um i i still think there's just a subset of people who would not come across this work without a book and i think that's you know probably reflected in the numbers i mean there's already more people that have purchased the book than are regular listeners to my podcast so that's actually very surprising to me i wouldn't have guessed that necessarily I would have, I would have, I mean, I think that that book is like for everybody. And I, I feel like, you know, honestly, there's people that consume our podcasts that are wanting something to do every day at work. Cause they want to hear archery. And there's probably people that, you know, like, like hearing some of your deep dives, but there's probably a lot of people that don't cons like, I personally don't have time to like consume podcasts. I don't know how people do mm -hmm. it. You know, I, it's like, I set aside time to cut my grass just for podcasts. And dude, <laughs> so I'm, I'm like, I'm really close to the part that I'm most interested in, in the book. And I shouldn't say most interested. I just want to see how it unfolds. But, um, so I'm on like chapter nine and a half right now. So I'm getting, I'm getting close to the, to the, the, it's, I've heard more about 11, I feel like than anything. Interesting. All right. Well, I can't wait to hear what you have to say when you get through it all. <laughs> I love it though. It's, it's so, um, it's so, imp it's such a good book. And I honestly, I love having the option for audible because yeah. the fact that you read it, it's almost like. I think because I I know you and I know how you articulate and how you how it, it's you that way you know whereas obviously if you're reading some if I was reading something I would just probably be skipping past half the words and like <laughs> not even getting the full detail but hearing you read it is a lot like when we've been in company together and people have asked you a, you know a t technical question for your field and how you elaborate and expand um it's i i really like it that way it's it's better for me sharon was reading it and then she jumped in the the car and you know how sometimes your podcasts freaking just automatically start playing in your vehicles have yeah, you had yeah. that and you're just well, like I think, what yeah sometimes apple play or whatever will just pick it up immediately even if it wasn't on right away yeah, I know. So I'm like, I just jump in and all of a sudden you're talking and she's like looking at me like, <laughs> and I'm like sorry, no, about it's that. his book. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I, I really like that part. I like that you articulate it and everything. So, well, yeah, I'm glad I read it. I, th I think, I think nonfiction is, 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 and probably should be read by the author. Um, I don't, uh, you know, I, I just finished listening to a nonfiction book that was not read by the author. It was read by a professional. So it's read by an actor. And truthfully, I, I think it took away from the book. Mm -hmm. um, I think Sharon it, was, says that. It, it felt fake to me because I actually wanted to know what the author's emotion was, not a heightened, it probably exaggerated emotion of the person reading it. So um, as painful as it was to read the book, 
And as much as I initially didn't want to, I'm very happy that I listened to feedback from a number of people, but mostly honestly, like fans and listeners of the podcast who said, you got to read it, even though I was looking for any excuse to weasel out of it. <laughs> Well, no, I, I, th I think it was good that you did. Did you change much? Like if you read back your book all the way, are there changes you make? Like when you're actually trying to articulate it? Yes. So this drove my publisher insane. My publisher <laughs> wanted to kill me by the end of the project. Because I could imagine. Too. When you're reading a book, you're theoretically reading a version that is immutable and can't be changed. Yeah. And every single day I would finish because it took me nine days to read the book, nine days in the studio. And at the, at the end of each of those days, they would get a list of 15 to 20 changes. Like, and they weren't huge because I knew I couldn't change spacing. Like I right. couldn't change the number of pages or change the location of a reference. Right. But I could certainly change a word here and there and substitute this. And yeah, it's just a funny story. Like it, 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 I mean, basically my COO, Lacey Stenson had to become the ultimate buffer between the head publisher and me because they, they wanted to kill me. Like they would have sent a hitman to my house to take me out. <laughs> and she was like, you got to understand, Peter, you just got to let him do his thing. Like he's, you know, he's very particular. And I think reading the book is the, in some ways, the only way you really know what's right. Because prior to that, I had only edited it by reading it in my head. Yeah. And and it's when you read something out loud, it sounds like... So your audio broke up a little bit there. Um, yeah, so one of the things I was like curious about with that book was when like when i edit when i'm editing hunting shows or something like especially when i was on the network and i was producing all the shows and antoine was editing it you almost see like you know what's going to happen to where like i was wondering if you're reading it back does is your brain actually saying things that you were thinking more so than you actually reading cuz sometimes if you see the same thing enough times, you have to have someone look at it because your your mind is like going ahead of you and you're not actually reading the thing. So I feel like if you had to No, that was actually something that um that the like the director was really good at. So I worked with this amazing woman who was like both coaching me, but also she was the director of the of the reading. And that was, I think, one of the most important pieces of advice she gave me, which was you know this, you can almost recite this by heart. You can't read it that way. Read it as though this is the first time you are seeing these words. Mm -hmm. And the easiest way to do that, there's probably an archery analogy here, by the way, is go very slowly. <laughs> so she said, read it at about half the speed that you think is reasonable, because that's the only way you will be able to focus on the words that are directly in front of you without skipping over them due to boredom and anticipation of the next words. And yeah. that's why I, and I, I, sus I suspect a lot of authors are given this similar advice because I think audiobooks always sound really slow. Mm -hmm. I just think they are, they sound slower than the way we speak. Well, I think I'm actually as slow as people think I speak. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yours is one of the few um videos on youtube that i actually like to listen to at about 1.25 <laughs> everybody says that i mean if i if i try to talk any faster then just a whole bunch of stupid words come out so <laughs> yeah uh, there's nothing wrong with going slow and i think it's because my brain is actually wanting to reply to multiple parts of the question at the same time so mm -hmm. I almost have to like singularly nail it down to be able to understand what the heck's happening. So let's talk. <laughs> Dude, this is the worst timing for a podcast. Maybe it might mm -hmm. be good. I don't know. You may have a freaking breakthrough or a breakdown. 
So you are, we had already scheduled this podcast, but you're, you you hit a, uh, a little case of the yips <laughs> this week. <laughs> so big you're slump. To- yeah. It's you're two, totally last like- two weeks. It's been two weeks of big slump. Well, you, you waited a week to tell me. That's uh, true. I, I was trying to work my way out of it without bugging anyone. <laughs> you're like, I'll get out of it. What do you, th- so what do you think has happened? What do you, what? Do you think um do you think you focused on too specific of a detail and it kind of tripped you up? Like I feel like you're so hyper analytical that well, I know you make it harder than it is. <laughs> but yeah, it's interesting. It's it's definitely possible. Um I'm trying to I've I've been replaying the last mind the last month over and over in my mind. So, you know, I think for the last three or four months I've been shooting well. Um, we moved from the NTN to the Levitate 2, and I liked it so much that I got a second one so I could have two different weights. Mm-hmm. And so I was, you know, putting a lot of reps into the lighter weight, which we have at 60 pounds, um, single pin, you know, light arrow thing was yeah. working really, really well. And then I went back to the initial one that you got me for my birthday which is the exact same riser. We just have different limbs on it. And it's at about 72 or 73 pounds. That's we're using a 300 spine um, and 150 grain point. That's going to be the hunting rig. And honestly, I had no difficulty transitioning back. I thought it would be hard to make that jump of 12 pounds again. So this is now we're talking probably in June. I think I did this right after. When was the San Antonio attack? Because I did it right after the tack. That was in April, that. man. That was in April. Okay, so so basically, right after April, I went back <laughs> yeah. to to this thing and felt great. And then in like, I think in June, I was like, oh, you know what? I need to make sure that this thing is broadhead tuned perfectly. And so what I did was I went in and started working with Jordan at Archery Country. And last year, what worked really well for fixed blade broadhead was paper tuning bare shafts to fly identical to field points with uh, veins. And if I could make a a bare shaft fly like a veined arrow out to 40 yards, hit identically parallel, no up, no down, no left, no right, and then throw a big fat fixed blade on it, it flew perfectly. And that worked with the... um, kudu point which is what i was using last year and i use that big kudu point 150 grain one and three eighths inch at this widest point it's a sail right so this year i wanted to switch to the cayuga which i think is a far better at least as we, we're going to talk about hemodynamics and penetration i'm sure at some point in this podcast i'm very excited to see what this broadhead can do but i went through the same exercise so so that's the last time the bow was in a bow shop right it was like four weeks ago when I took it back in. And that's when we made some micro adjustments um, to the rest. Mm -hmm. And it didn't take long. I mean, I usually go into the bow shop thinking I'm going to be in there for three hours to get this. It it took like three adjustments. And we the thing was just the bear shafts were flying perfectly. The next day, I put the Cayugas on, I put two Cayugas on with and without bleeders, went out with field points, and just started launching bombs. And at 80 yards, you couldn't tell the difference. Like it was, I, you know, I was like, okay, I don't need to go past this other than to see at what point the drag starts to weigh down on the arrow. Right. But basically the, I would say the, I don't even think the drag kicked in until about 85 or 90, but I'm not going to be taking shots there. So I just knew that for all intents and purposes to 80 yards, the Cayuga flew identical to a field point. I did this for three or four days. And then I said, I'm not putting another broadhead on this bow again, and we're done. So as far as I was concerned, a month ago, I'm fully broadhead tuned. I'm ready to go. And now it's just preparation for Maui axis deer. I'm just going to be shooting, um, you know, an overkill broadhead, but I'm back to practicing with field points. So again, all of this is going totally well. And then two weeks ago something just changed where i started getting really big spread on that 
target that you got for me, which is my favorite target by far. So for people listening, this is that really, really big Merrill round target with the red cube in the middle. Yeah. Um, I don't know. What's the name of that target? Is there a specific? I think it's name? a Morel range target, but it's got the um, it's got the high roller dice in the center. Yeah. So you can either have it as a one spot or a two. So I, I shoot it at the one spot, like a one, you know, it's got about a tennis ball size white dot in the middle of a red cube, which sits in the middle of a big black circle. And well, there's also know, three, we, four and five and six. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just have the number one out for, yeah, for how I'm shooting too. it. So for whatever reason, I just know everybody's eyes are a little bit different, but the, from the first day I shot that, it was like my eye loved it because, yeah, you know, obviously when you're outside of 80 yards, the pin is completely covering the white dot, but it it just grouped very well. And so that became basically I would shoot that target from 80 to 110 yards. And again, not because I'm going to be taking shots there when I hunt, but that's, you know, that's just a distance where any mistake gets magnified and yep. everything was just going very well you know, um, very good groups, probably five inch groups, um, at 80 and, you know, probably by a hundred on some days at a hundred, I'd still be at five inches, but at other days it might spread to, to 10 inch diameter, but overall it was just very consistent. And it's unclear to me exactly what happened, but two, two weeks ago, the spread became three X that, and what, I mean, my immediate realization was it's not the equipment. Like, I don't know why. I just had an intuition that it's not, nothing went wrong with the equipment. Something's going wrong in my shooting process. I went and got another version of the exact same release I was using. And like, just as a way to say, hey, like, just try to release, didn't matter. So using the exact same release, nothing changed. Um, and I've sort of fixated the the failure as I think something in my left hand, I'm right-handed. So my hand on the riser, I think that I'm getting very inconsistent pressure on the riser. Mm -hmm. And what I can do effectively is check my relaxation of the fingers. So I can, you know, I'm very good at making sure I'm not death gripping and that my fingers are either not even touching the riser or if they are, it's a very light, relaxed touch but what i and this might be psychological but what's sort of spiraling me out of control is if you can imagine sort of um, a pressure map along the thinner eminence of the thumb mm -hmm. i now all of a sudden feel like i have no control over where that pressure lies and i believe that the enormous variation that i'm seeing is a result of my inability to control that and then by the time i called you a week later you know, we started trying a few other drills, like taking it up close. You know, it is windy in Austin. So I was also kind of giving myself the benefit of a doubt and saying for a couple yeah. of days, well, 15 mile an hour winds probably make this a little bit harder. So I started doing a little bit of shooting from the shed at 20 yards. But unfortunately, that did that got worse. Um, so anyway, so here we are not sure, but we don't have to spend too much more time on this. We can, we can talk about more interesting stuff for, for the average person. No, but honestly, this is great for the, for the average person because slumps can happen, you know, slumps happen a lot. I mean, there's, there's different aspects to it for you. I, you know, I'm trying to play the doctor and mm. listen to symptoms so, and, you know, I've like asked you several things cause I'm, you know, the first thing I try to do is try to eliminate, you know, what, what would I think it would be? So, I mean, we talked about, you know, I talked to you about like, Hey, just try closing your left eye because your, your grouping started to go horizontal. So then I was yeah. asking you about like, what is your pin actually doing on the target? You know, is it, is it, is your pin doing a different thing on the target than previously we talked about that we talked about hey just cl try fully closing the left eye make sure that you're not slowly starting to like change eye dominance where those wild mm -hmm. lefts are coming from maybe your left eye starting to take over uh we talked about that then i talked about you know hey dude if it's windy like i'm not going to be still doing my 80 90 100 110 routine I'm going to be out of the wind, up close, just focusing on technique. So I tried to get you close, yep. which you've always had. And then, and then we also, we also, 
We also spent, I probably spent three days just shooting the silverback, which I hadn't shot in a couple of years. Um, felt it's, the silverback is such a, such an enjoyable release to use. Um, I, I think I was telling you the other day, I mean, my only, the only reason I wouldn't hunt with a silverback, and I know a lot of people do, is I don't have enough reps yet where I can control my excitement. And sometimes I have so much back wall in it that the second my thumb comes off the release, the arrow goes. And if I'm shooting in the backyard, that'll only happen once. And then I'll remind myself of where the back, like I can titrate it, but I always worry that in a hunt, you don't have that opportunity I yeah. can regulate and i i all i think deep down my fear is in a hunt i'll have i'll be so excited that i'll have that back wall in there and it's not the end of the world because if you have good aim position coming off the silverback you know release slowly wouldn't you know it wouldn't be the end of the world if if that released the arrow but um anyway that that unfortunately with the silverback i shot just as poorly and uh and actually not that different from how i was shooting with the hinge yeah, it was very similar, which, you know, which kind of leads me to where is, you know, when your pin's going off, are you outside of that? Are you constantly out at nine o'clock when that pin's going off when you, you know? No, no, I think what's happening and that that's why I think it's, it's hard to explain, but it's like the second the release. Are you grabbing your goes, bow? I mean, if uh, you're meaning, grabbing your bow and you're squeezing with the fingers at all then obviously that yeah that sight's going to turn in which would make you kind of if anything wouldn't that make you go more right no if your pin moves right you're going to hit left yeah so um any any type of finger pressure will turn the sight pin to the right which yeah. th which then you would essentially aim further left to, yeah. even though you don't know you are I, I think what i'll probably do tomorrow is set up cameras and just film film everything um, do you have a long stabilizer did you ever get one i've gone back and forth right now i'm not using a long stabilizer no well the reason i'm asking is because a drill that i do with students when i'm worried about torque is I set up cameras directly over the top of them. And when they're shooting a 30 inch stabilizer, mm. I mean, technically the camera would be this way. Cause I'm like imagining range is here, shooters yep. down here. So when they draw back and they're aiming, if that stabilizer is like bending out here from an overhead view, you can see the torque. Obviously the longer the rod, the more it's going to oh, magnify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and, and when I work with like teams, I'll actually have, there's usually I'll put a shooter that I'm working with on a seam so that the overhead camera, you have a straight line. Usually the yeah. concrete has a straight line. I'll find a place. So then you can just pull back and you can watch. Okay. You can kind of just scrub right through like a full end, right? Like six arrows. You can be like, all right scroll through this shot you're dead on scroll through this shot up oh, you know yeah scroll through this shot your way out and but you know if you're sitting there like that every time and you're getting those wild lefts then at that point yeah, i would troubleshoot from a different place rather than the front hand so i wonder um okay that, that's very interesting unfortunately my stabilizer is probably only 10 inches or something but yeah it'll be um, tougher to see yeah there's um i was actually gonna send you something there's um and I, I i gotta see if they still have them but um so i i worked with um sherlock for a long time which you know and um one of the things we did was incorporate the little iq um it's called the retina lock have you ever seen it no. it's essentially a it's a green circle that has a black thing in the middle and it's it's like a prism so if you have any torque the the black dot won't be in the middle of the green circle and it's that, at the front of the stabilizer it no this is this is a sherlock site that they used oh, to be the right okay. beneath the bubble you're right beneath your front bubble is where that little retina lock hmm. was 
they used to sell them individually. You could buy them. It almost looked like a bow level and you would kind of have to find a place to like mount it on your site. So you could kind of, instead of like, well, you'd still need to look at your level, but like when you look at your level, you'd look at that retina lock too. And it shows you whether you have heel pressure, high mm. wrist, you know, because anything you do misaligns that black dot in the center of it. So you pretty much have to adjust the black dot. So it's dead center when you feel like you're at your best shooting. And then it's just an easy reference, but you know, I haven't seen you shoot since April. Um, but some of that could certainly come from your draw cycle. Cause that's been one of the things I've continually tried to work with you on was the efficiency of your draw cycle and not, um, not like leaning the bow at the beginning of the draw cycle, because then you're torquing it to get it back in. Um, yeah. so, you know, that was one thing we had you work with where I had you standing right next to a, to an outside wall so that you would get in yeah. the habit of being able to raise the bow straight to the target. Do you feel like you're still doing that? Uh, uh, meaning I, I feel like I'm correct. I feel like I have corrected that. Yeah. I, okay. I feel that's something I'm very cognizant of. Um, and I feel like I have a, a, a very straight back draw now. Um, but, but again, like I, I acknowledge that I think sometimes what you think and what you do aren't the same. Um, so I think it's time to just get a couple cameras and tripods out. Tomorrow. I've got to send you this. You, yeah, so it's interesting. I have tried using that. Um, oh, do you have one? I don't, but I feel like, I feel like I tried. For those of you listening, I just showed them the heel plate on the, what you can mount on the levitates, the heel plates that we have for the grip area. I got to check if I have one. Would my bow have come with one? It wouldn't have come with it. It would have had screws in the side for it. I called Tyler to see if he had any in stock to where you, they can run you one over. Okay. Because that, where that's actually placed and the width and the flatness of it, I mean, yep. it's going to self-align that bow way more than way more than anything with the radius, you know? So if you are yep. kind of fighting, that's, a, that that's a really good idea. That might be kind of a really nice change to introduce quickly um, to kind of break the cycle. Cause it's a, overall, it's a smaller surface area than what I'm trying to mount to now. Cause I'm, you know, I have a piece of grip tape down the whole riser. So in other words, there's kind of less, there's like there's just a greater area that I'm trying to lay up against and equalize the pressure for than than that heel device. Yeah, I really don't like grip tape too because well, did you say grip tape? I or took you... it. I took it off by the way. So so that was that was the first okay. thing I thought was I said it must be the grip tape. So I, then I went bareback for like five days, yeah. took the grip tape off, and just had the bare riser. Nothing got better. So I was like, screw it. I'll put the grip tape back on. Yeah, anything that's tacky to the front hand is going to cause problems because obviously you want you kind of want your hand to self seat. Um, yeah, yeah. Hold on one second, Peter. I'm going to grab something and show you a little something here. Um, wish I had a riser in here. I don't... So one thing you can kind of do too. This isn't. This isn't totally the same but it really does help people is if you hold a lighter in your in these these three fingers pinky mm -hmm. ring middle finger you're gonna you're gonna just learn to hold a lighter like this so that your hand can see into that exact spot and when you're doing this it's it's going to prevent you from getting your palm across. So mm -hmm. it, it just, uh, it, it forces you to keep these finger, these fingers off the riser. And yep. it also allows you to relax that wrist back. So are you seeing what I'm doing? Totally. But my question is, is your pointer finger at all touching the front of the riser? I that mean, one right there. Yeah, it, it, it is resting against it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, especially with that freaking land shark, you're gonna shoot, don't shoot your finger off, dude. Yeah, touch the front of your pointer finger to that riser just like that. 
Yeah. You know, you don't want that coming up. And it, and honestly, when you're holding this, it's actually really hard to get that up there because you're going to feel like you're going to let your freaking bow go. Do this with your 60 pounder. And yeah. honestly, uh, and I know you, that's you know, cool. I know that's kind of a ways, but you can. You yeah. Can yeah. Yeah. No, I like that. that. Like that. So this kind of like puts you in a pistol shooting position and then this will fit right in there like that so for those of you listening um what i've done is i grabbed a regular lighter and i'm putting the the lighter um i actually have it upside down is how i have it so i'm the bottom of the lighters pointing up and i've got it i've got the bottom of the lighter even with my middle finger as my middle finger's curved and I've got my ring finger and my pinky finger also curved around that lighter. So I've got fully exposed thumb and index finger, but also the part of my palm that's, that's important. You never want to cross your lifeline of the palm. So where your thumb comes in and connects to the wrist, that's where you want the grip to seat at the bottom. But yeah, just learning to uh, to relax that back so that you have even pressure, and just hold that lighter like that. That's that'll work really, really well. So, I like that drill. Try that exercise, um, and see how that goes for you too. So, one of the questions I wanted to talk with you about was kind of the importance or really some of the things that can and do happen with animals when they're shot with broadheads because there there's a continual debate and I, and by the time this podcast comes out I'll have had a few other podcasts that have come out that'll be really good I did a very good podcast with uh Bill from Iron Will um you know and obviously he's a very favorable to a fixed blade head and and um which I'm favorable to fixed blade heads too, but just me personally, I like sending a big two inch cut into stuff, you know, and, and if I miss, it seems like the majority of the time, if I hit something not exactly where I want it, I'm back more than I am forward. So I've just, I elect to have more cut the if I'm back or, or if I hit, you know, a straight up, one of their quarters, you know, I, I feel like there's plenty of arteries and stuff around and the, the, you know, the bigger the cut, the more that happens. And I just know if I'm going to hit a dead center, you know, femur or, you know, a, some type of a knuckle, then I'm screwed anyway. So that's my philosophy, but I'm kind of curious what's your thoughts now that you've kind of seen a broadhead in action on animals and from a medical point of view, just some of your takeaways. Well, you know, I mean, I think the, the couple of caveats, right? So first off is like, you know, I'm just not a very experienced hunter, right? I mean, the number of animals I've killed and since I've been hunting has only been, uh, I'm only four and a half years into hunting and in that period of time, you know, despite I don't know, like we're, we can, you know, we're talking tens of animals, maybe, maybe a total of 30 or 40 animals <clears throat> that I've been able to do dissections on after I've killed them. So that's, that's, I guess that's the other thing I would say is I've, I've I try to always dissect an animal after I kill it. Um, so before I, you know, I want to actually see what happened internally and try to do an autopsy. Basically, I want to know what was the cause of death. Right. Um, and, and I'll do that even for someone else's animal. So if it's, I'm hunting with a buddy, I want to see like when you killed that elk, when we were together two years ago, I wanted to see the damage of the arrow on that elk as well. Mm -hmm. So the second, so, so basically I don't have a ton of veterinary experience. Um, and most of what I'm going to say really comes from the area where I have much more experience, which is tragically looking at how humans die when they are hit by projectiles. Yeah. <laughs> and in particular, it's, uh, and I guess just for listeners, so they understand what I mean by such a grotesque statement, but, you know, I trained in general surgery and I trained at a very, very violent place uh, in Baltimore it's called Johns Hopkins. It's a hospital in the middle of uh, 
uh, East Baltimore. And, you know, we averaged more than 10 penetrating traumas a day. So penetrating oh trauma is, 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 is gunshot <laughs> and knife wound. So, um, you know, guns kill people kind of different from knives, right? So you have to be a little bit mindful about trying to extrapolate from what a gun does to what a knife does. Um, and even within how guns kill, there's very different types of damage. So a nine millimeter round is a very different round from a 308. Um, so, um, and, and again, anybody who's familiar with firearms will understand this. Nine millimeters go through people. They're, a nine millimeter behaves more like a knife. A 308 does not. A 308 is killing its victim far more based on the kinetic energy. Yeah. Whereas a nine millimeter round is killing its victim based more on the projectiles puncture. damage puncture exactly okay so what are we talking about how do animals die this is the question animals die almost exclusively from hemorrhagic shock hemorrhagic shock is a type of shock that occurs when the circulatory system collapses due to massive loss of blood Animals can also die from neurogenic shock. I have unfortunately killed one animal that way where I totally botched a shot and hit it straight in the spinal cord and immediately dropped it and it died. But I mean, that was a very messy way to kill an animal. Although, you know, it wasn't my intended shot, but that's very unusual that you would kill an animal through neurogenic shock. Um, tragically, when a hunter makes a mistake and gut punches an animal, that animal's probably going to die, but they're going to die of septic shock. So that's absolutely not how you want animals dying. Septic shock is bad for all parties involved, right? The animal suffers. You're not going to harvest it and eat the meat. I mean, everybody loses. Mm -hmm. So so we basically want our animals to die of um, hemorrhagic shock. And to accomplish that, you want as much blood loss as fast as possible. There's another type of shock that is, I think, relevant to hunting, which is like cardiogenic shock. So you can, cardiogenic shock is a type of shock that occurs when the heart can no longer pump. And that will become relevant at some point in this discussion when we talk about a pneumothorax and a tension pneumothorax. So we'll just kind of park that for the moment. The bread and butter, again, of how animals die is massive blood loss. By the way, what people sometimes forget is that that blood loss can occur into the body. Right. That doesn't yeah. have to be outside of the body. In fact, most experiences I've had killing uh, deer, elk, things of that nature, virtually all of the blood loss went into the body. Uh, so the animals are bleeding into the abdomen and into the chest, and that blood is effectively out of the body. They have no access to the oxygenating capacity of that blood, and that's still another form of, um, of, of septic shock. Uh, pardon me, of, of um, um, uh, um, hemorrhagic shock. So if you want to kill an animal with hemorrhagic shock, you have to, by definition, cut its blood vessels. And there are two types of blood vessels. There are arteries and veins. And interestingly, I think people sort of assume that hitting arteries is the best thing, but that's not actually necessarily the case. Uh, if you hit a really large vein, that's actually a quicker path to death in many ways because veins do not have muscular walls and therefore they have no capacity to spasm and contract. Um, mm. So technically when you hit a small artery, there's actually, uh, if that's the only injury, uh, a lot of times that can be a survivable injury. Whereas a small vein, if hit, can actually be a very lethal injury because it can't close off. So what are the dominant places um, that, that you, you want to go about doing that. Oh, sorry. There's one other thing I would say, right. Which is sort of when, when you hit an animal in the lungs, you have what's called a pneumothorax. That's sort of a combined type of death, right? So why, why is that such a valuable shot? Because you're creating both massive blood loss and you're also layering on top of that respiratory loss. So you're, right. you're, you're injuring the animal in two ways, and you're basically giving kind of circulatory shock and hemorrhagic shock simultaneously. 
So let's start with what the perfect shot is. I think the perfect shot technically is a shot that would um, penetrate the animal and cross the mediastinum. So what's the mediastinum? The mediastinum is the area between the lungs that contains the heart, the trachea, the esophagus, and the great vessels, which is mm -hmm. the aorta and the vena cava. Those things are wrapped in a very thin layer of tissue. So anytime you've opened an animal's chest, and again, I really think it's important that people after they kill an animal do this. It's important to sort of see the anatomy, to understand where these structures lie. Like where does the heart lie in relation to the lungs? Um, any arrow that, if you hit an animal and you your arrow goes through the mediastinum, it's very hard for me to imagine a scenario where that animal doesn't die almost instantly. So I think it's worth reflecting on that for a moment. If you put an arrow through the mediastinum, even a field point, the yeah. animal dies and it dies almost immediately. Yeah. Why? Because by definition, you are hitting a great vessel, the heart, and almost assuredly both lungs, but probably, I mean, you're hitting at least one and you're probably hitting both lungs. So, you know, the old saying, like a 22 to the heart is better than a 308 to the thigh. Well, yeah. <laughs> this is this is kind of like the example of that, right? Like yeah. put, you can put a field point with a 40 pound draw cycle, you know, through the mediastinum and any animal is gone. So what we really want to imagine is because we're not perfect and, you know, we're playing in a world of uncertainty, like how do we increase the odds that we can get something in the vicinity of that? So this gets to your point, right? Why do you like shooting a broadhead that expands and creates a two inch cut? Well, it just gives you a greater probability that you are going to at least nick something in the mediastinum. And yeah. again, going back to kind of what I've seen in humans, I mean, tragically, I have seen people die with two millimeter cuts in the vena cava. Yep. That's all it takes. Like it's really important to understand how much blood loss can occur from such tiny, tiny cuts. I've seen people die from two millimeter nicks in a pulmonary artery or a pulmonary vein even. Yeah. And by the way, if blood ever leaks into the pericardium, which is the fibrous sac around the heart specifically, that animal will die immediately uh, via something called tamponade, where the heart can no longer expand because right. the, the pericardium is not you know, malleable enough to expand. And therefore, eventually the blood that fills that compresses the heart and that animal dies in diastolic failure or and tragically that human will die in that situation. Yeah. So the real estate in the mediastinum is so sacred that you just want to be hitting it like that. We don't tell, I think we don't tell hunters to aim for that because we say the lungs are a bigger target. And that's yeah. absolutely true. Like if I'm staring down an elk, I'm just trying to hit it in both lungs which means I'm up and back from the mediastinum because it's a safer shot. But I, I just, I guess we could start the discussion by talking about what perfection is. You, you put a tiny four millimeter field point through the mediastinum. Doesn't matter. You'll drop a grizzly bear. Like it can't go more than about six feet. So, so now the question that I think John becomes, given that we're not perfect, given that we're using bows and not guns, given that we don't have x-ray vision and therefore unless you have a lot of experience and you understand an animal's anatomy you might not even really understand where you're aiming for what is the advantage of one type of broadhead versus the other i think in many ways it's just a trade-off right it's the trade-off between a, a really good fixed blade has inferior flight characteristics a lot of the time unless you really know how to tune a bow mm -hmm. i think it has a lower cutting diameter, but it's going to be more forgiving in terms of any angular impact. So for example, the one really negative experience I had with a tripan was on an axis deer and I shot it. I don't know. Like, so if you're right behind it, I was probably 15 degrees off mm -hmm. the back and to where you'd have shot. to pretty much go in behind the last rib. 
That's exactly right. And try to come out at the left side front shoulder. Yeah. Or so let's be clear. It, I think maybe. Yeah, exactly. I think that was a marginal shot. I probably shouldn't have taken it. And I, this is anecdotal. I don't know if it's really, if it really matters, but what happened is the arrow went in and it just sort of like went under his skin, yeah. you know, and it didn't, it didn't cross over. It just didn't have enough. Uh, it was such a tight angle that it, it just didn't, did, didn't go across. And I'll, I'll always wonder to this day, I mean, I tracked that animal for like the rest of that day and I could see it because it was a brightly knit, knit, uh, lit knock. I mean, he looked unfazed by it. He was like, he had the inconvenience of something under his skin. And I couldn't, I've always wondered, like, if that were a fixed blade, would it have gone through and at least hit one lung? I don't know. Um, you also hear stories about people saying, hey, look, you know, my tripan or, and tripan is actually probably the best expandable I've ever shot, but I've certainly seen yeah. people using like severs and things like that, where they just they don't open on ribs. So I, I think I understand where people come from when they say like, they're skittish about using expandables. Yeah. 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 There's definitely, um, if you can do it, there's for me, I, I credit a lot of my success to cutting diameter. Um, so, you know, I've, and, and listen, I shot fixed blades for the first half of my life probably so and i still do i'll still shoot a few animals with them you know or if i need a follow-up shot and it's longer and i'm worried about penetration at an extreme distance then for sure you know i'll grab a you know a fixed blade head and, is, and it, what's your is, is the muzzy your your fixed blade of choice um i've I honestly, I try a lot of different ones that I'm curious about. The Trocars flew really well. The G5 Montex solids uh, yeah. fly well. Um, these Iron Wheel, one, the 100 solids, I really like the shape of. I really liked those Kudus. Um, you know, in the. You know I what would, I don't I would like that I've experimented use a with? a smaller one, but. You would use the 125 or the 100 grain kudos. Yeah, pro yeah, probably. Just because otherwise, you would. I would definitely have to be sighted in differently yeah. from like tripan, which is like you know number number one, or a dead meat number one. I'd have to sight in so differently to try to get that wider cut to be on the same page. I was messing around with the 150 grain annihilator. That thing does not have good flight characteristics outside of about 40, 50 yards. Yeah. They're really good guys. Um, but yeah, I mean, just looking at that, uh, you know, I, I felt like telling them it's, well, I did tell them actually, they, they wanted me to shoot. They like came up and they said, put this on and sh you know, shoot at a hundred yards right now with everybody watching. And I just said, you don't want me to do that. And they're like, no, no, it's fine. Do it. And I'm just like, <laughs> It's is it does it's not gonna fly like a field point. It is not a field point. So it's not going to fly like a field point. And it didn't, but uh, listen, a lot of them are not. You know, a lot of them are yeah. not. It's just it's a it's a different projectile. Well, I love I love um now iron will, by the way, I, I also has a uh, single bevel, doesn't it now? Yeah, that's what I got. I actually just got a single bevel. I like the single bevel on on his because his are so robust that I think even though it's a single sided bevel, I think, uh, yeah, right here. I mean, they're not I think, cheap. Uh, I bought these. No, I, I think, think I paid I like think, 130 bucks for, for three, for three of, them. of them. Right. Yeah. I think Justin Lee, our buddy shoots that and, um, has had incredible success with it. I, I really think that's a great looking broadhead. I, I haven't shot it, but when I just think about kind of what I've read about, projectile um mechanic you know i'm an engineer right that's i was an engineer before i was a surgeon so um i try to think about it both from an engineering perspective and a biological perspective so i yeah. am also partial to single bevel uh projectiles well so to, well let's talk about that you know because i'd want to con continue down your your path because i love hearing it um but why do you like the single bevel then because I think side. if you're 
if you're going to if you're going if you're going to the trouble of shooting a fixed blade you might as well double down on the reason you're doing it because we've already established the fixed blade has two areas where it is inferior to the expandable one it is never going to fly quite as easily right so you're always going to be more susceptible uh, i guess there's one exception to that which we can come back to which is in a branch in an area where there's a branch or something overhanging obviously yeah. you run the risk with an expand let's put that aside for a second and then the second area is you're never going to have the same cutting diameter so if you're giving those things up then you're basically acknowledging that the whole reason you're shooting this is for greater penetration mm -hmm. and you're going to get greater penetration through cartilaginous tissue or bony tissue with a single bevel because of the forced mechanism by which the single bevel forces the arrow to move uh, rotationally through the tissue. And it's really interesting also how destructive that is to tissue. So I know this as well when I watch what happens when I shoot these things at targets. So I have some targets in my backyard that are only for broadheads. So these are kind of uh, thicker targets that I'm willing to turn over much more quickly because obviously yeah. they get trashed. And when I look, I mean, I remember the first time I put a kudu into one of those things, I simply couldn't believe both the penetration it got and the damage it did to the target. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so again, I think that's why you, you know, if, again, if you're going to shoot a fixed blade, you're basically saying I'm hedging on the fact that I might hit a rib at a really bad angle. I might hit a shoulder. Um, I've shot that kudu point through the shoulder of an elk and put it in the opposite apex of the lung. So it went through both lobes of lung and lodged in the opposite shoulder. Now it wasn't right at the humerus, like right mm -hmm. at the the top bone. But if right. you think of like it was, it was right beneath that. Yeah. So <laughs> like a femur, pretty much. Yeah, but it's still now. By the way, to be clear, this was an elk I'd already killed. We took it back to the meat shed, hung it up, felt exactly where we wanted to put it put a yeah. mark on the skin and I stood there and launched it and launched multiple different arrows to look at different penetration patterns right. and nothing penetrated better than that kudu because it was the only one that was still double lung. So it, yeah. it went through shoulder, through same side lung, and then through opposite side lung and right. then lodged into opposite shoulder. Um, and none of the other, even none of the other fixed blades did that, but I didn't shoot any other like, I didn't at the time have the single bevel iron will. I would have liked to have seen that. And didn't we shoot that at like 10 or 20 yards or something? Yeah, 20 yards. Yep. 20. It was 20. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. So of well, course, yes, you could you could extrapolate from that and say, well, gosh, at 60, would you have had that kinetic energy? How you know, you we could have calculate got through how one. Much... I mean, yeah, probably. Yeah. I think you probably could have got through one, you know. But there's a lot to be said about when an animal's hanging versus when an animal is like clinching, you know. For sure, for it, sure. And, it seems. And, um, but I think this is more realistic than going through like gelatin or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I where, agree. Yeah, yeah. I, it seems like it seems like with the gel, with the ballistic gel, it's almost like that's supposed to determine penetration, but it's also supposed to like stop the projectile so that you can like scientifically study it and so mm. the friction of the arrow shaft itself on gel it's not a super fair comparison because you know it is nothing but a slippery mess yep in real life <laughs> you know what i mean it's like what we should be shooting is a block of ky jelly you know <laughs> Like if we were yeah. shooting that, we would know what the penetration test was. But when you're shooting something that's like, you know, like those dang things that kids have that they slap on the wall and like pull them off, you know, it's like <laughs> it's <laughs> it's like that's yeah. what we're testing penetration on. But it's it's very different, you know. Once you're actually in a cavity, it it it. It, you know, it's very, that's why, like, even the knives that I have, I'm like, you know, when I was working with Josh, I'm like, I want more gription on the knife. Cause when you're in there, things get slick pretty quick. 
Yeah, I think there's just kind of another overarching lesson of if, if there's anything I saw in trauma surgery that blew my mind, it was how much luck or good luck or bad luck is involved in the direction of the projectile. It, you know, so so I'll give you a very crazy example was like I remember taking care of this one patient who uh just such a ridiculous story, but the, you know, this guy was out with a couple of prostitutes and he decided <laughs> not to pay them. And you know, you I think most prostitutes would probably just carry a 22 or something, but I think in Baltimore, you know, they're carrying 45s, right? So <laughs> He, she, this one woman pulls out the 45, goes to shoot him right in the face. He lifts his hand up. She shoots here, blows like his pinky and third finger off. Bullet hits his mandible, fractures it, deflects down, hits his clavicle, fractures it, goes through all three lobes of right lung and hits all hits the main PA, the pulmonary artery, hits the diaphragm, shoots through the liver, then back into the colon, into the small bowel where it puts like 20 holes, and then sh comes out his body and lodges into his lumber jacket. Oh, and that's my how God. that's how he came into the hot. That was one bullet did all of that. And my point is, did you save him? We did, believe it or not. This was one of <laughs> Damn, the most bro. remarkable. This guy came into the hospital basically dead. Um, he was so dead that when he came in, the head of trauma, when when he knew what his vitals were and his pH, which was 6.9, anytime the pH goes below 7, it's almost an unsurvivable injury. It means he's lost too much blood. Again, it's okay. way too much hemorrhagic shock, right? Right we would have needed to open up a bed in the ICU to make room for him after surgery. And the, uh, the head of trauma said, you don't need to, he won't survive surgery. Like but he, he'll, he probably won't get out of the trauma bay into the surgery. But if yeah. they end up taking into the surgery, he'll never get out. And not only did he get out of the trauma bay, he, he gets to surgery where he requires 60, six zero units of blood, all the blood at Hopkins and shock trauma to then make it to the ICU. A, a month later, that guy was out of the hospital. Oh my God. It's just an unbelievable story. That so, is amazing. But kind of here's the point of it. Take that shot a thousand times. You'll never reproduce that one moment. Right. Like it's so, it's so, it's just, it's, it's a game of micro millimeters. And I think that's, what brings it back to what can you do when, when, when I'm the hunter, what do I want to do? I want to minimize variability. I want to minimize like the risk that something doesn't go right. And I think when I started hunting, there was this combination of cockiness and I'm smart. So I'm going to like, I only aimed for the heart, which was like, you know, and I, and I, and I got away with it for a while, which then boosts your confidence. But then you realize like, that's really dumb because your margin of error is so small. So it was, it was really then that I realized like you, there's too many variables you can't control there. Sometimes you'll hit the heart and you're lucky, but if you just back up and always try to go double lung through mediastinum in a higher, at a higher angle, worst case scenario, you're going to go double lung. And this gets to another point, which is, and I don't know the answer to this question, John, but how often do animals survive single lung pneumothoraces? Th this is an interesting question, and I would really love to know the answer to this. And I, 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 and maybe just to give people the definition so they understand what a pneumothorax is. So pneumothorax, so the the lung has uh, a, a, a layer of very thin connective tissue on top of it called the pleura, and the lung cavity has another layer of connective tissue. And under normal circumstances, as you and I are sitting here breathing, those are perfectly stuck together. So as your ribs expand and your diaphragm goes down, your lungs expand to fill that space and there is mm -hmm. zero gap between those. So the lungs are perfectly stuck. Yep. But to be clear, that's a false space. Like when you do surgery on people and you open them up and you introduce air, it completely separates. You can put your hand in there, 
So a pneumothorax is when you put even the smallest hole, it can be a pinhole, literally a pinhole into the lung, now allows air from the lung to escape and it will push into that space. And it will now open that potential space into a real space. Yeah. That is a pneumothorax. So virtually without exception, anytime an arrow of any sort, again, this could be a field point, but broadhead, whatever you want, anytime an arrow hits the lung, you're creating a pneumothorax. Now, a double pneumothorax is an unsurvivable injury, even in the absence of blood loss. Now, technically, you can't do that when you're hunting because we're using broadheads. Right. But if you put a pin into each lung through the, through the outside body, you'd create a double pneumothorax with no blood loss. That animal would still die. Yep. So they're, they're still going to die. What would be the time shock. on that? Like, would that just be after enough? Depends on the size of the, depends on the size of the holes. But um, if you if you gave me like a, I don't know, a twelve gauge needle, which is like the size of a, like a like the lead in a pencil. So think about yeah. how small that a twelve gauge needle is. If I punched a twelve gauge needle into the chest on both sides of a deer. I don't think it could survive more than 10 minutes, <laughs> probably less if it freaked yeah. out, right? Because if it freaked out, it would start, the, the harder it breathes, the quicker it dies. Right. Because it's going to pump more and more air and it's going to shrink those lungs. Yep. So, um, see, and some of these topics are so awesome because, you know, I don't think there's ever going to, there'll never be a clear winner on the mechanical slash fixed blade topic. But the one thing I'll say is when you see enough things die, you also like, I, you know, I've, I've, I kind of lean towards what I see kill the most things. And I, and I lean away from the things that I see what I would assume are fatal hits, but what I personally think is there wasn't enough cut trauma or poor luck to where something survives by that. Whereas when the weird things happen, you know, freaking pinky to yeah. jaw to collarbone to you know everything in between like that stuff happens when an animal is reacting and trying to yeah. get out of the way like i'm not only thinking oh i hope i don't hit the humerus bone or i hope i don't hit the spine what i'm thinking is like okay like as soon as i see that reaction i'm like come on expandable this is time for you to do some work because there's, like you said, there's like, there's vessels, there's arteries, there's veins, there's, I mean, there's literally that thin wall of the diaphragm. I mean, I've nicked that and never even hit a vital. And it's like, and without that diaphragm, that thing doesn't function either. So, you know, there's like so many of these little bitty, like, what ifs. But I kind of go back to, you know, it's like, for me, the bigger that hole is, I honestly feel like um, there's kind of an argument. There's an argument with uh, a fixed blade that it just zips through and they don't go as far because they don't know. If it's a zip through, like on a, a liver, gut, or even single load of a lung, and they just keep doing their thing and walking off. A lot of times there's no blood. The blood seals up because of the small hole. There's nothing to find, especially if you're back. Like gut will clog that thing just with pressure and like no time flat. And but for me, when something gets hit and half that arrow or, you know, for me, half the arrow is 16 inches. So almost on any animal that to me, that's dead anyway. Um so when that's hanging out, it's like they try to get away from the danger that they sense, but they also know they're really freaking messed up. So if there is like a single puncture or something like that, they normally are kind of like 
ow, this looks bad. This looks bad. I think something's bad. I haven't ever seen that before. And it seems like they don't go as far after that initial, like, get out of Dodge sprint type thing. That's that's my experience and my thinking. Um, but, uh, I mean, so much of this is just based off, well, just like with you, you know, when we were together, I went on several track jobs. It just seems like if something gets hit in camp, Dudley's getting called to go track. So, I mean, it's like if people say, well, how many animals have I killed, which is, I think, a lot. Even if I took those off the plate, I'd be like, I know I've tracked more than the average hunter in their lifetime. Mm-hmm. And so do you think that, okay, so let's go back to a, another pretty common scenario, which is you're you're aiming for lung. So, so this happened to me two years ago. So on an elk, 27 minutes after sunset. So I had three minutes left of legal light. It was very hard to see. I misjudged the angle that he was standing. Mm-hmm. I believed he was rear quartering at 45 degrees. So I aimed back ribs, thinking mm-hmm. I was perfect shot. I took a good shot. Turned out he was front quartering to me at about 10 degrees. Gosh, is that the one at the water hole? Yeah. Okay. I didn't know. I didn't know that that angle had changed. Cause when you and yeah, I yeah. talked, you had said, Oh yeah. So I was... thought, I thought this guy, I thought this guy was standing rear quartering at 30 to 45 degrees. I was like, I'm going to double lung him right now. Gone. And he was I front quartering to me. Yeah. So I was like, Oh, I just gut punched him. Like that's awful. But he died in like five minutes. Yeah. He, yeah. he walked 40 feet and dropped dead. And what was the injury? So again, great example of doing the autopsy. Didn't even touch his lung. Here's what's funny. It actually nicked the pleura on the right uh, lung. Uh, Not the lung, but on the diaphragm side. But there was no pneumothorax. It just ripped his liver. And the arrow went right through him, by the way. So I found the arrow was, you know, 40 feet away where I hit him. And... There was no, there was virtually no blood, except it was all in his abdomen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he he died in about four minutes due to massive blood loss, exclusively from his liver into his abdomen. So bad shot, good outcome. Or, you know, not necessarily bad shot, but bad appreciation of the angle of the animal led to incorrectly placed shot, but still got to the right outcome. Now, what that tells me is, you know, wherever the path of that arrow was, it hit enough of the intrahepatic, intraliver blood vessels. I mean, the, and the liver is a staggeringly bloody organ. Yeah. That even without stopping and having the arrow create more damage. And then, by the way, this was that big kudu. This was yeah. a 150 grain kudu. So it just kind of ripped right through him. Um, nothing could have stopped that blood loss. To your point, sometimes you get a nick of the liver, but if there's enough compression on it, the, the blood will coagulate, the injury yeah. will stop bleeding. Do you think on average, the shot I took is less likely to be lethal than had it gone into the liver, but the arrow, like if it was a tripan, let's just say maybe it wouldn't have gone all the way through and the tripan stays lodged in the liver and the animal in reacting to that, moves the arrow, which then moves the broad head and creates more tissue damage. Is that kind of your experience? Well, that's definitely what can happen and what I've seen happen with with, an, with a fixed blade. And it's one of the arguments, right, why a fixed blade, you know, if the animal's still running, you know, it's no different than someone still stabbing. Um, but the thing is, like, for me, it seems like when that cut gets wide enough, yeah. the likelihood of self-sealing or them even laying to where the pressure isn't somehow misaligning a cut that is double the length of a cut that is smaller, it just seems like, I don't know, it, it just seems like the success on a a hit like that, like that's just a reality hit. You know, and honestly, a lot of these, this, these are awesome discussions. Like I'm 
super nerding out about this um, podcast right now. Is anybody still now listening that to this podcast? Yeah, I think I honestly think there's probably more people listening right now than with a lot of stuff that I've talked about. Um, yeah, the, and and so I've got a couple. I've got a couple questions. I'm hoping I don't forget. Um, but yeah, there it's it's so interesting. And the thing with the liver, one of the questions I have with you, the liver is kind of a very weird organ where some liver hits are just ridiculously fatal, and some liver hits you would almost think it was a gut hit because they can almost go overnight sometimes with, with a liver, but sometimes you hit a liver in an, in a different spot and it like, it is just, you might as well hit them in the lungs. It's, it's the same. So. Well, what... the liver is interesting because it depends. So on the periphery, on the outer part of the liver, um, you have a greater likelihood of compression and the blood vessels are getting smaller and smaller. Perhaps, in the abdomen, there is no more deadly area to get shot than uh, what's called the portal triad. So um, the, the liver is one of the only organs in the body. And for all intents and purposes, you could say it's the only organ of the body that has two blood supplies. So think about how unusual that is, right? Every organ basically works by having one blood supply, arterial blood flow flows in, and venous blood flow throws, flows out. Straightforward, right? Well, what makes the liver so interesting, both from a physiologic perspective, but also from an anatomic perspective, is it has two completely distinct inflows of blood. The first is what you would expect, the arterial input of blood. So the hepatic artery, which feeds oxygenated blood from the heart to the liver. But, and this is the important part, it also has what's called the portal vein. The portal vein is the confluence, the joining of the splenic vein and the inferior uh, or the superior mesenteric vein. And the splenic vein, vein also feeds off the inferior mesenteric vein. So picture basically all the blood from the gut carrying all the nutrients that have been absorbed flows into huge veins that flow into the liver. And so the liver is getting this portal vein coupled, which isn't providing any blood, but it's providing all the nutrients because the liver is the master regulator of nutrients. And then that's locked on top of the, or beside basically the hepatic vein. It also has the bile duct, which is what makes the triad, but that's not really what you're gonna die from. But you nick that portal vein. I mean, you put a one millimeter nick in the portal vein, you're dead. Like you're dead. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. You're dead. So I, that's an unsurvivable injury for, again, the same reason, which is it's a floppy little vein that has no capacity to constrict and, you know, spasm. So it's just, and you're draining all of the blood from the spleen, the colon, and the entire gut is all going to come bleeding into the abdomen. So why are some liver hits survivable? Frankly, if they're far enough away from that structure, you could put a big gash in the liver, it could get compressed by the diaphragm, you're gonna be fine. Whereas mm -hmm. you put a pencil hole into the portal vein and that animal's gonna make it about seven minutes. Golly. Which gets back, it all comes back to just luck. I mean, mm -hmm. so, so, you know, you would never tell somebody, dude, aim for the portal vein. Like, I mean, <laughs> gosh, even if you could see the thing, you wouldn't do it. Right? I would, I would do experiment. <laughs> <laughs> How big so, was that kudu? Was that pushing two inches, that freaking thing? One and three eighths. See, I mean, that thing, I like the fact that it was kind of in between. You know, it was, it was kind of the in-between, but yeah, see, that's the thing. Like I just know from experience, there's just people times should know where... that's a, you only get that cutting diameter when you're willing to go to 150 grain. So yeah. my arrows, this is why I have to carry two separate arrows, right? So I'll run, if I want to run a tripan, I'm, I have to shoot that on a totally different setup. And on the NTN, I had the ability to do both because yeah, I a cool was crossover. We had a really great crossover where I could shoot the um, the FMJ 
in a 340 spine with a 15 grain insert on a tripan weighed two within two grains the same as an axis with 150 point kudu it was right. literally the arrow made a difference of exactly the 50 grain yeah yeah well yeah it was um the 50 grains was enough to put your two arrow combinations within two grains of each other which was That's right which was pretty cool at the same length which i can't do with the 300 spine i'm not able to do that on the current bow so One that's question. why i'm only shooting the kudu uh, the um cayuga yeah so one question i've always been curious about do certain animals have a different ability of clotting than others because i mean i feel like some some animals honestly like an antelope those suckers just like freaking bleed out uh, it seems like their blood's thin and hmm. whereas something like honestly like a bear um honestly deer seem like they have a an unbelievable ability to clot like the the clotting just seems to happen so much faster is what would is there is there a variation i i, I do not know the answer to that question but it's absolutely possible that that's the case i, I could okay. easily imagine that 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 that's the case it's, it's really interesting it would be so great if you know if there was like an insanely wealthy person out there who really wanted to do this type of research and was was willing to fund this because a lot of these questions are very knowable right like you you could there are very objective ways to study coagulation I mean, we do it in humans all the time like we know every detail about how a human coagulates normally and when it's abnormal and because there's lots of different clotting factors and we, you know, on a human, you can do so many different types of tests to learn and pinpoint exactly where there might be a deficit. So, you know, for me, it's almost impossible to imagine that all animals would have the same degree of uh, coagulation. Yeah. And, and that's, that's another reason why sometimes when you get into debates on these things, you know, when I go hunting or when I'm, planning a hunting bow for a year i'm not going to be very singular in species i'm covering you know i'm covering a, a very diverse palette of species and so like some of you know if someone like honestly if someone said what head should i use on an antelope i'm pretty much just going to say if you hit that thing it'll freak itself out and die like they hmm. just they're high strung. They, they freak out. They normally just hit the gas pedal and if, and, and they're going so hard and heavy that a lot of times I don't think blood has time to, it doesn't have time to, to clot up or anything. They just freak right out. But then you shoot something that's like dense. You shoot something like, like an elk or a bear, you know, and, and bear are actually, you know, cognitively they're smart enough to they'll pack they'll actually pack a hole like they'll wow. go and lay down and they'll you know they'll they'll pack it you know so they're they're actually thinking that way so i mean you know that's... well that doesn't surprise me actually right if you think about it from an evolutionary <laughs> perspective because bear fight with each other in a way where they're violent they use cutting instruments to fight they're using claws so yeah. bear are used to fighting other bears it wouldn't surprise me that they've evolved to learn that whereas deer don't you know or antelope they don't interact with each other in that way yeah uh, at least probably not as regularly i mean Once that, that a could year. be a total nonsense explanation but but that that would be the first <laughs> thing that would come to my mind as to why maybe bear have evolved to recognize that um and then tell me about whitetail how do they behave with respect to clotting like ex exceptional i mean hmm. exceptional yeah deer are insanely tough i think their blood I mean, a, a lot of times, you know, even if you shoot one where you don't necessarily have um, blood loss, it's it's cavity contained. The cavity will literally be a two gallon black clot, you know, wow. like they they it's it's almost like once air hits it, it's just turning it, you know, it's turning to just a, a, some type of a solid putty matter you know <laughs> so the the one question i've i've always pondered um is you know when an arrow goes in and that arrow's lodged in there and you've got a single arrow in 
on and and honestly people misjudge angles more than anything like i didn't remember that story but i've certainly had times where people are like thing was dead broadside to me blah 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 and then all of a sudden the guide's like yeah i filmed it and you look and you're like dude that thing wasn't broadside at all it was right like, it was like facing oh, you yeah it was practically facing you <laughs> that's literally like one lung and into the liver but it seems this like... is very hard by the way i make this mistake on my freaking 3d targets <laughs> and i and i but i do it deliberately right like i'm always out there moving them and rotating them yeah. and seeing if at a great distance like you know that axis deer that i have which i love it's one of my favorites that my friend jake muse sent me and just the other day like i was out there shooting so notwithstanding the fact that i'm also shooting like crap but i'm looking at the thing and i'm not that far i'm 75 yards from it which is again probably further than I would ever want to take a shot, but I'm sort of like, look, That's for you sure should be able to at 75 me. yards in broad daylight to see how this thing is standing. Right. And I was completely convinced it was broadside. And I launched three arrows into it and I go and look, it was facing me at 30 degrees. Oh my gosh. And I'm like, what, I mean, how am I not able to see this? Well, when their legs are, you only have two legs. That's true. You've only got two I mean, legs. Yeah. yeah. When, when you have four legs, well now, you know, it's like, if you only see two legs, you know, it's broadside, you see four, yeah. it's gotta be on some kind of an angle unless it's. Yeah. It's but, but, but it's an important point because I think all of this comes back to shot placement and it comes back to the same Ex goofy <laughs> statement at the outset, which is a 22 to the heart is way more lethal than a of a, a freaking 300 norma mag to the kneecap like you, you know shot placement shot placement shot placement is everything and that begins certainly by knowing the orientation of the animal and having a sense of where the vitals are well how about having equipment that instead of shooting a 10 inch group shoots one inch groups because that's the difference, you know, if but that's shot when, placement, right? I mean, that's the yeah, point. It's like you've got to be able to hit. But you know, you can know shot placement. It's like I can look at a Vegas face and know that I need to shoot 30 X's, but that doesn't mean that's where they go. And if I have a if I have a setup yeah. that isn't forgiving, then I'm rolling the dice, even shooting at the spot I know I want to hit. Whereas what I want people to do and what the rant I've been on for the last two weeks is focus on your fundamentals, know where your freaking bow hits, put an arrow in the right place. Like, let's start, if we're going to argue, let's argue about where we should hit. Like, honestly, yeah. if people are going to debate with, with, uh archery equipment if you're going to debate i think the more productive debate is where to be aiming you know where do yeah we i want to ask you a question about where this. do we want so, to hit so, like that's that so, seems so, like a, a better question so what's going through your mind when you are looking at an animal are you um so i'll back up for a moment right so so in you, you, you know, people use the saying, aim small, miss small, right? And when you look at an animal, are you focusing in on a particular shadow, on a particular piece of fur that has some distinctive, this, this distinctive feature where you're treating that as an X and mm -hmm. you are, you are forcing your eye to treat that with pin movement as though you were literally looking at, you know, the spot on a target um and uh, walk me through like your cognitive thought process as you look at animals and by the way does it differ like i've always found i have a fallow deer and a axis deer target they're the two hardest targets for me to shoot because they're littered in white dots yeah they're spotted and, yeah so so how do you think through that process i think my brain sees silhouettes more than anything um because like if i look at essentially the silhouette of an animal target my mind just automatically puts a dot right where i would want that to be you know which you know i follow the inside of the front leg up to about the third mark you know if i can see the tip of the elbow i'm just slightly high right of that ultimately is where i want to be i want to be 
above uh, above the elbow b- knuckle and then where that scapula begins to come up and it'll you know mm-hmm. well i guess the arm bone will come up and it connects to the scapula and then that sc- yep. scapula will expand up that triangle is the key like you yeah. know that is a hundred percent the lights out mark i mean that's like stuffing arms together heart valve freaking just blood loss to a point so just just to make sure i hear what you're saying you're saying you are picturing where the bones are and you are creating a target that is bounded. I just saw the video that you made a while ago where you drew the triangle on the elk, right? You use the white tape on your elk mm-hmm. and you talked about this golden triangle. And right. you, know, you and I have talked about this a lot. Is that what your mind's eye is actually seeing? My mind actually sees seeing that. the yeah. border and you're aiming in the border. You're not looking. This is an important distinction. You're not looking for the target. You're not putting a dot where you want to hit. You're you're saying, here are my boundaries, hit inside the boundaries yeah i'm pretty much like in my mind i'm kind of like shooting a steel plate (laughs) you know i'm like okay danger danger you know anything there is all golden now given my brain like if i just pulled if i ever just ripped back you know if something just stood up and i just ripped back and went up like i'm not going to be looking for definition my mind is going to go right into like full robot mode of what does that thing's anatomy look like? And, you know, and I'm going to get my pin in the right spot. Now, if I have time to look at it, uh, yeah, I'll definitely try to find definition, whether it's like a shadow, whether it's a white spot, you know, um, you know, sometimes that back leg will be like tucked back, you know, and you'll, you'll kind of see that, that muscle kind of getting, you know, sometimes, I'm, I am looking at that stuff, but for the most part, when I see a silhouette, I know from where that leg comes up to where that elbow thing is like all that, it might as well just be a steel freaking rebar steel post. Cause my mind is like, okay, there's the iron frame of the bridge. Here's mm-hmm. the arc of the bridge. You know, I, I, like I've got all this real estate, but you know, if you send it anywhere into the, the framework, it's just, you know, it's not going to be a good situation. So, yeah, I mean, I'm like, we're just looking at my hat right here. I mean, like, you know, my brain probably sees like that more than anything. And yep. yeah, I mean, I would instantly just be going, well, in this case, that one leg's back, but I probably would have gone up right between the two right to there like my pin would just go there i wouldn't even think your pin would go to basically where the e just below where the e the middle of the e hits the r yeah yeah it would be more like there yeah between the that post of the e and there like right there i think and just behind all day yeah Yeah. but and and again i I think most people understand where and why what where why you want to hit there i think what's interesting to me is what your eye and your mind are constructing because that's actually different from how we shoot targets Mm -hmm. uh, 2d targets right that's different from how we shoot paper targets where we shoot x's yeah or dots yeah Um, and that's so that's i think that's just worth noting right i think uh, um it's worth someone like me and probably the listeners thinking about what are we thinking about (laughs) what are we cognizant of when we're doing this what is yeah there there's like this weird um there's this weird pressure that i feel like i used to put on myself and i feel like other people might do it too um and that was why the other day when you told me you're struggling i'm like hey no more like picking a spot let's just aim silhouettes um because then you're like you're almost you're trusting your float within a quadrant yeah, Rather which is than, a little more float, but a little more forgiving. Yeah, and I actually had a video about two weeks ago or three weeks ago called Aim Big, Miss Small. Mm. And that philosophy is kind of what I was trying to apply to you. And actually, if you would have watched that, it probably would have been I don't right. I think I've seen that one. Let me, it, let me make it. It would have been just prior to your yips. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I did one that's just aim big, miss small, because sometimes when you're trying to hyper aim, it creates 
either being static or freezing underneath it because you're you're so fixated on it that yes. your brain doesn't want to cover it, right? Yep. yep. Whereas, whereas when I see like essentially a hula hoop and I'm just like, you know, I'm going to, I'm trusting my float within the middle of that hula hoop. And I know my setup isn't shooting as big around of a group as a hula hoop. It puts, it puts an arrow exactly where the pin is. So if my pins inside that hula hoop, I'm like, I'm happy with it. And that's a big reason why, like the amount of practice starts to play into a hunting situation because when things happen really fast you want your subconscious to be able to do that you know like i'm looking at the the steering wheel um up there behind your head you know that's essentially like you know that's essentially what i'm looking at the top, yeah. yeah the top of that's going to be spine don't want to go out if i'm if i'm on the right of it i'm a hundred percent like humorous elbow potential bad if i'm further you know if i'm to the back of that thing i'm just straight guts and at that point come on tripan um you know and if i'm under you're just you're honestly if you're under it's either a clean miss or it's a, probably a non-vital you know being low that's why i always tell people i like to come up from the bottom because ethically I feel like if I miss low, I'm less likely to fatally like wound that animal. I either want a clean miss or, you know, if I'm under, if I'm under the cavity, I feel like that's a better scenario than being anywhere above the vitals. You want to hear, you want to hear something very interesting. Uh, I find yeah. this to be just fascinating. So our, our good friend, uh, Jake Muse, who, how, how have you not met Jake yet? I don't know. I don't but know. We, <laughs> We, we're going to have to get you out to Maui. So as you know, Jake <clears throat> um, runs Maui Nui Venison, and um, they're running this insanely uh, humane, remarkable operation in Maui where they harvest axis deer um, for uh, USDA-grade food production. Right. So how do they do this? Well, they shoot them at night. They shoot them under night vision um, using, uh, you know, typically a 308 round. Now, here's the kicker, right? Um, so obviously, these are headshots because you want to preserve the meat, but it has to be fatal. So missing is totally fine. Injuring is never fine. Mm -hmm. So... Their snipers are trained to do something that is totally counterintuitive, which is they are trained to shoot such that they will accept a miss rate of 25%, but the miss is always high. Yep. So in other words, they're not aiming at the perfect shot. They're aiming north of the perfect shot so that anything... And, and so I forget exactly what their group is. I think they're aiming, I think they have a one inch circle mm -hmm. or maybe it's a two inch circle that they're trying to hit, but it's shifted up such that 25% of the time they go straight over the deer's head. The deer doesn't even know it. And 75% of the time it's a immediately fatal shot. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in five years of doing this, there has only been one shot that didn't hit in the exact spot it was supposed to um, on the low side. And there was one shot that really missed and hit the neck. The animal still died instantly, but that was the one notable failure. So clearly just an impressive track record. But the reason I bring this up is I've never really contemplated this from an archery standpoint, which is you could almost make the case that as an archer, if an archer came to be good enough in understanding their groups, you almost think that you would potentially change your aim point such that you would accept a higher miss rate, but know that you're always going to miss low and away from the animal. Again, I, I don't know that it would fly apples to apples, but when you said that, it just kind of made me think well, of an it, interesting It parallel. is my mentality. Yeah, I mean, obviously with a bullet, much different, you know, going for a headshot, but yeah, I think what happens a lot of people when they're trying to come down on the target is, you know, if all of a sudden that voice goes off the head saying, 
you know, I'm on the hair, you know, put one in them. Well, you're coming at it from a very non-fatal approach, Mm -hmm. you know, versus, you know, you know, you can, you you only have that much space coming from the bottom before your fate, you know, before this is a fatal shot. So, you know, you're either going to freak out and hit the trigger before you get to that place. Or once you're there, you know, I, I kind of think you're there not to mention deer don't react up and down, you know, they react down too. So when you're coming in from the top, you know, if, if you shoot your shot prematurely, it's just a double hazard, you know, they could be dropping. You're already aiming in a non-vital area, you know, you're essentially hoping for a spinal shot when you're that high versus when you're lower, you know, it's either, like I said, a clean miss or, you know, there's, even if you're, even if you're barely, barely low and back, like, you know, I've seen many times where the entire cavity just gets dumped out, you know, everything south of the diaphragm just kind of, gravity doesn't really hold it in there very well if it's if it's lanced you know it's it's coming out which becomes fatal too so on the um let's let's go back to like a if there's a lung puncture um and that arrows in and the and the skin is sealed up around that but the animal's still breathing what's going to happen yeah, so that even with a single lung injury, if air, so now we go back to we're in the pneumothorax situation. So let's just say it's a single lung. So you've shot an arrow from, say, behind, or it doesn't penetrate, you know, or it penetrates, but then it hits the spine on the way up or something, hits like ends in the vertebral body. There's lots of ways you can single lung an animal. So you've injured the lung by definition, you've entered the chest cavity. So now air, oh, and let's assume there's no other vascular injury. So let's assume you are not hitting aorta, you're not hitting um, vena cava, and you're not hitting bronchus. I once hit a shot where I, I once had a shot with a tripan where I sliced the trachea completely, total Mm -hmm. transection of the trachea. It's actually the second fastest I've ever seen an animal die. It's, well, it's, it, 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 I mean, think about that for a second, right? That's more than a double lung injury, right? Yeah. Like that's just a complete, that's, that's complete loss of circulation. So let's assume none of those things have happened. And all we're talking about is arrow enters cavity, doesn't exit. And that entire lung now is bleeding air into the pleural space. So in most situations, air is not able to escape out the, uh, or there's two situations, I should say. Situation one is air cannot get out the chest wall hole. Right. In other words, where the arrow entered, air can't get out. Yep. If that's a case, there are two things that are going on. The first is the pneumothorax. And I believe that that is survivable. Meaning I do believe that for a really long time, an animal could survive on one lung. Okay. What is not survivable is if air is not able to get out the chest cavity, you will start to build up pressure in there because the air is going to continue to go from lung into chest cavity and it can't go from chest cavity to the outside world. So what that does is create now what's called a tension pneumothorax where it starts to push the mediastinum over. And now the heart gets compressed and the other lung gets compressed and that's a fatal injury. So in trauma, we saw those all the time and you have to decompress those patients immediately much quicker than you do with a routine pneumothorax and um i think the question that i don't know the answer to of course is does broadhead choice impact the speed with which that process occurs for a single lung This could be a very interesting question, right? In other words, if you had reason to believe that one type of broadhead was more likely to seal its hole on the inside, on the chest, um, paradoxically, that might actually be better. Because typically, we don't think that way. Typically, we say we want a broadhead that blows wide open so that there's a lot of blood coming out. And that's true if you've caused a major hemorrhagic insult. But paradoxically, that animal 
will not de develop attention pneumothorax. So in other words, if you put one of those broad heads into a single lung, but without a major bleeding injury, that animal might actually be all right. At least it if won't be the pressure, If the pressure can If escape. the pressure can get out, that's right. I mean, because that's the main thing to this thing. Could an animal live? I definitely agree animals can live off one lung. I actually killed a deer, Peter. I don't know if I ever tell, did I tell you about the deer that I killed that actually had an arrow shaft in the, in one lung? There was an actual no. shaft that it like all, but you know, it was just like, you know, it just looked like scarring, like bad, yeah. thick, hard, you know, calloused scarring on both sides. And the lung was like, very dark it looks like it looked like it was dead within the body yeah yeah but but that was in there you know yeah. so well so there um, you go there, there's proof that an animal can live on one lung provided provided that while that process is happening air he's able to vent air to the outside while that scarring takes place and heals the hole so that eventually what was happening in that animal is when air comes in his trachea, it goes just to the bronchus of the other side. And he's just, you know, look, he's not a perfectly functional animal. Let's be clear. He's not going to be able yeah. to run as fast or as long as his peers with two lungs, but he's not going to die. And um, so, so, so there's an awkward trade-off, right? Because the arrow that has the smallest entry is probably the one that's also most likely to seal up and lead to attention pneumothorax in that situation. Whereas the one with the broadest entry is going to have, the, it's like creates a, you want to basically have a one-way exit valve. Yeah. Um, again, I think all this just speaks to a point, which is I, there is no right answer to the question, which, and, you know, there's and, no right answer to the question. What's the And a lot of times head? it seems like on, you know, if you shoot enough animals, you also find that, it's not all the time where you just have the hide and, oh, there's a hole I can put my hand in. A lot of times you have to go in the hole of the hide and then you have to kind of slide back to where the cavity was. So a lot of times that skin, depending on how it's tearing or the angle it was on, a lot of times you can go in, but once it moves, well, the skin itself will slide over where that entrance was to the cavity. and that kind of creates a different thing too. Well, right. and so, are... so, so for people to notice that, so this is an important point. It, it, you, you know, this is happening when you go, when you step up on your animal after the animal's dead and you notice a ton of bubbly blood at the hide, that's what you're seeing. Okay. What you're seeing is the valve. It's that the, it's that the, the bubbly air is the air being forced out of the lung and trying to get out and it's the what you're seeing is the the hide on the and the ribs kind of trying to seal that hole so no air gets back in okay so that that's that that's like in the like and again that animal might have died from a hemorrhagic experience right. but you're also seeing it try to fight off the tension pneumothorax and that's where all that bubbly uh blood is coming out so um, that's how you know there's a lung injury in addition to a vascular injury yeah now if you nick an artery, so sometimes during a, a blood trail, sometimes you see the clear bubbles in the blood and people automatically assume, oh, well, that's double lung. I've actually seen like shots where it's like a major artery to where it's almost like that thing's gushing at a point to where it creates froth not from the lungs but from the totally. actual yeah I, I don't i don't think you can infer from blood on the ground what the source is i mean you can infer um I mean, you, you might be able to infer very venous blood from very arterial blood because the venous blood will still get somewhat oxygenated, but it still looks darker than the arterial blood. But, you know, if you just think about it, like when you pour a bottle of wine into a glass, it still bubbles, right? Like oxygen, yeah. air is still mixing with the wine and it's aerating the wine as it hits the glass. So I don't think you can tell, I don't think you could tell that. I think it would be very difficult. Um, well, do you, so I guess going back to that subject, if it's definitely a pass through at that point, if it was a single lung and you have two holes at that point, air is definitely escaping, right? There is no collapse. You're saying if you pass through both lungs, 
No, I'm saying a single, if, if you pass through an animal where you have yep. an entrance and an exit, but only a single long lobe, how would that, uh, I, I mean, at that point, the other. Okay. So let's long... say, so let's give an example. So, so, so you're saying, so you could enter front lung and come out in the gut, like go diaphragm gut and exit on the backside, for example, but leave the opposite lung intact. Yeah, exactly. Like any type of, uh, well, white tail shot straight down from the top, shooting yep. off a cliff where you're going literally one side. Yeah, um, yep. uh, I don't think there's a guarantee. You probably just increase your odds because you've put two holes in the chest cavity. So you at least increase the odds that you can vent air out. Yeah. And I, I mean, and that's one of the things I've told people who are so passionate about a pass through being the end all. I've said, well, if you had a single lung and you have two holes, then you you have a much higher chance of losing the animal because they can totally survive. I think they can survive off one lung, especially the bigger ones, you know, especially the bigger ones, elk. Um, and I've certainly seen whitetails. And that's the other thing, too. I feel like success of recovery is also very relative to the demeanor of the animal at the time because you know when when people are shooting elk during elk season and that thing comes into a call and it's literally coming in knowing that it's completely ready to fight and this it's thing it's got a lot of adrenaline it's like fully adrenalized and then you hmm. shoot this thing and then it hits a fight or flight mode and they're already kind of just in a zombie phase anyway, because they're just fighting and screwing for three weeks, like beyond their physical, you know, they're like in Good buds, point. you know what I mean? So it's, and the same thing for whitetail, you know, if you're right in the peak of whitetail rut and you're rattling and this buck comes charging in straight under your stand and you send one into, you know, you get a single lung shot. Well, now, and that, you know, when that happens, if that thing is supercharged, it has the ability to go as long as the other lung is functioning and as long as the pressure of any internal bleeding has the ability to escape. When it does, The other thing escape, to keep in mind, though, on the single lung, I think it's important for people to understand. I think for an animal to survive a single lung, it, it can't suffer a significant hemodynamic injury. Right. So the pneumothorax needs to occur where the lung gets punctured, but none of the major vessels within the lung or in the middle. Uh, so, so basically the further you get from the center of the lung to the outside, the less likely you are to hit a major vessel. So for an animal to survive a single pneumothorax, yes, it's doable. You've obviously demonstrated that. I think conceptually it's doable, but it can't suffer a hemoneumothorax. So a hemoneumothorax is when the chest fills with blood. It's right. the thing that is, it's the blood that fills the chest that's causing the lung to collapse, not the air. And that's much more difficult to survive based on the capacity for the pleural cavity to put blood to work. Because now he's got two insults. He's lost half of his breathing capacity and he's lost a third of his blood volume. That's a very different situation. Which again, I think... If we were going to come back to the original question, all things equal, I, I would feel, notwithstanding this trip, because I want to try the Cayuga, I really prefer an expandable on deer. Yeah. Because I think they have a much smaller window of vitals. I think they're much quicker and much, uh, they move much more. They're more, especially axis deer in Hawaii, very, very jumpy. Yeah. And, and therefore, and penetration is not an issue. Their tissue is, their, especially axis to your, like their shoulder, you can blast right through it. So yeah. it just doesn't really, you, you, the advantage of the of the fixed blade becomes largely moot. And you would, you so you really want to trade everything in favor of maximum cutting diameter to just increase your odds of hitting some blood vessel on the way to hitting at least one and hopefully two lungs. Yeah. So the next question I wanted to ask you was, um, and I, I did a, like a little test on this one time based on something that I had read. I don't know how accurate it was, 
But, you know, sometimes when people track an animal for their first time, they assume, like, I've had people be like, oh, my God, look at the blood. And I'm like, dude, if you cut two of your fingers with a knife, you're going to bleed that much. Like, yeah. oh, my God, look at the blood. There's, like, for me, there's different versions. <laughs> there's, like... You know, I've had some where it's just like, what happened here? This is like worse than a crime scene. But then there's some where like, you know, any type of a nick on a major tissue that doesn't realign itself, it can bleed, I would say, two or three X what people assume the blood could be. So how fast does that blood loss need to happen? to where they would essentially get lightheaded and like pass out? So it's a good question. I don't know animal literature well enough. So I, I, I think um, this is this should be knowable, right? There should be somebody out there who, who knows veterinary medicine enough to be able to say that. Um, because for all intents and purposes, in a hunting situation, there is no adaptation. So it, it's, it's really less about the speed with which that blood loss occurs and it's more about hitting a certain threshold of blood loss. So if we were talking about blood loss that was occurring over weeks, well, then, yes, it becomes a question of, you know, even there, it really becomes a question of at what level do you become symptomatic? Yeah. Um, but but then you're dealing with two separate issues, right? So with chronic blood loss, again, just to complete the explanation, you're really dealing with hemoglobin. Oxygen carrying capacity is what will mess you up as opposed to volume loss. Volume okay. loss is what is impacting blood pressure. Now, again, in in the situation of hunting, it's really the volume loss that's killing you, killing the animal, I guess yeah. I should say. So, the, the, so then the question becomes, well, at what volume loss, whether it occurs in 30 seconds or 30 minutes, yeah. is it fatal? I don't know the answer. I would say extrapolating from humans like, 50% blood loss strikes me as virtually unsurvivable for an animal. And again, you would like for that to happen within a minute. Well, see, I had read, that, I had read something that on a, on like a medium game animal, if it loses more than one gallon of blood within one minute, it'll essentially pass out from from low blood so do we pressure. know how, what do we know what the total blood volume is on that animal because i know humans we i have... wanted to think it was like it was surprising one I gallon to... sounds like a lot yeah i wanted to think like the total volume was more like three and a half gallons and i'm trying to think well of okay what so let's think about that, that for a second so a human so a human is about five liters so that's like a gallon and a quarter is our yeah. blood volume yep okay and an axis deer or an antelope or you a white deer, a gallon. We're, we're talking 150 to 250 pounds, basically, in that range. So, I mean, a gallon would be almost I, all it's hard of for me to imagine. Yeah, it'd be hard for me to imagine. So, so, so anyway, it I, might I have guess been an elk. That, maybe it was an elk I was maybe talking that's an about because I think, yeah. I think I, I remember talking to a vet about it because, um, because what I did was I put, I filled a gallon, a gallon jug and I poked a hole in it and I actually just got on my little bike. Yeah. To see it, what that would look like. And I just started, go. I, dude, it was like, I pedaled for like more than a mile mm -hmm. before that ran out and I didn't do it in a minute. So you know, it's like when people track these things and they're like, I don't know why it wasn't just tipped over dead. I tracked this for a mile. It's on some of these animals. I think they're just vastly underestimating what. Well, not only that, I think people are missing the point, which is I would venture that most of the blood loss is still occurring inside the body cavities. Yeah. yeah. You have two enormous cavities inside of an animal, both the chest and the abdomen that are capable of storing the entire blood volume of the animal. Yeah. So like, think about that animal that you shot last year, the, the elk when we were together. So that, that elk dropped immediately. He kind of remember the, uh, he kind of rolled down the hill. Oh yeah. Wait, I'm trying to think what's, uh, 
So oh, I don't want to name, the, I don't want to name yeah. where we were, so, but, but yeah, yeah. In Colorado, we're in Colorado yeah. and, um, you were kind of up a hill from him. Why well, had to pull the, that thing all the way down? No, 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 no. That was to get him off the mountain, but he rolled down oh, about yeah, yeah. 20 feet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He flipped yeah, yeah, yeah. and flipped and rolled. Okay. So, so let's look at that guy. There was a lot of blood there. Yeah. But it wasn't that much blood in this grand right. scheme of things. Oh, Most yeah. of the blood was inside of him. Oh, yeah. And that's where I just think, like, I don't, th I just don't think you can impute much of anything from the blood trail as to what the state of the injury is. Right. Because you just can't, you just don't know. It's all about the angle at which the broadhead went in. You talked about it earlier, like how much closure exists between the hide and the fascia and the muscle. Like if you go in at an angle where that gets immediately shut off and that, and like that guy that I shot two, three years ago, that, that guy in the liver that I was talking about, mm -hmm. there's no blood. Like yeah. the 40 feet between where I shot him and where he died didn't have a drop of blood every drop including it was a through and through but every it blood will take the path of least resistance yeah that's the bottom line there's no mystery to this right and in that case the path of least resistance was i'm not going to go out through the fascia and around the muscle and around the no no just, just pool Leak. of blood in the yeah. abdomen and that was <laughs> yeah. it so yeah. so i think it's just very difficult to to talk about that and um or to to to, to sort of assume that one can say that and um you, you know which also by the way speaks to why you want to have a secondary threat to life you know it's one thing to just do it on hemorrhagic shock but this is another reason why the lung mediastinum is a great way to kill because you'll get the hemorrhagic shock and you get the cardiogenic shock yeah the pneumothorax and so if the animal can't breathe, it's going to die in, it's the most humane thing you can do. And it takes the need to, you know, uh, you know, chase an animal for a day. Yeah. All so right. Just, I think well, it's just important to think about those mechanisms, right? It's like, what, what is my objective here? My objective is to impact multiple systems of organ failure as, mm -hmm. as technical clinical and grotesque as that might sound that's the objective it's maximum organ failure maximum system of of damage as quickly as possible so that this is the most humane thing possible yeah, i agree and, and i think that's why you know for whatever reason with the heads that i've shot i feel like i cause a lot of bleeding trauma on top of you know the respiratory trauma or vice versa um but i recognize both the thing is like not everyone has the option to do that just based on penetration even if they shot a stupidly heavy arrow some people that shoot lower weight or just have the shorter draw lengths you know it's just so let's go through of... some of those parameters really quickly because I, I don't even know if i'm fully familiar with them so so if you so you've seen this cayuga that i like to shoot so what would be the parameters you would put on a broadhead like that or, you know, that iron will that you just showed there us. There are none. Ago. So there are none. The only but, but, but how would you give guidance to someone? Would, would you would say, look, you need at least a draw length of X and at least a draw weight of Y. What what parameters would you say? Well, I think there's just so many factors, right? It's like shot angle, animal size, distance, mm -hmm. you know, it, what, what kind of reaction does that animal have? What's so your what does Sharon what, shoot? One okay, so Sharon shoots um Sharon shoots a twenty six inch draw and she shoots forty pounds. She's killed everything as big as an elk. Okay. But so her draw weight's forty pounds, you said? Four zero, yep. Yeah. She's shooting uh I forget what it is. I mean twenty six inch right. arrow and her brace height is six oh. and a half. Yeah, I mean Sharon's probably shooting in the two forties for speed or something max maximum. Okay, and her arrow weight is probably just under four hundred grains. Okay, and what was her broadhead of choice? Um, she's probably killed the most with a Montec, with the G five Montec. The G five vented or not? Vented, just because she's not shooting fast enough to really create, you know enough like hit, yeah like a hissing yeah. sound you know so 
Yeah. Okay. But, so basically, you know, you're saying 40 pounds, 26 inch arrow, uh, 26 inch arrow, um, or 26 inch draw length, 240 feet per second, under 400 grains. She's never had a problem. Well, she's not passing through animals, but she's killing animals. And uh, honestly, Sharon that, that this sort of speaks to the point. Sharon's never lost an animal, just for the record. Um, crazily enough, her and Harry are both a hundred percent, you know, and all they that and their setups are very similar. But I also have limitations. Sharon has never taken a shot over 27 yards. You know, it's like, and we're very specific on angle too. It's like broadside as a minimum, quartering away as, you know, as first choice. And, you know, usually she's bearing to the fletch, but I like, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't like, rate but this a, i think this is the pass point. through I think this is... isn't very high on my on my like it, i'm not disappointed if i don't have a pass through uh, like all i care about is when i see that arrow hit my brain will tell you in like one second the likelihood of that recovery like I, as soon as it hits i'm just like animal's dead like yeah, I might have to go look for it. I might not have blood for 40 yards, but you know what? Like, animal's dead. It's to the opposite side, you know. Um, I killed a deer with a 17-pound Genesis bow and a Steel Force broadhead. And, it, it, you know, it just becomes apparent. It's like, like you said, with those needles, if you go in the right place, it really doesn't take much what I don't want is people to be shooting a setup to where they actually don't know where they hit. And it's not that it doesn't take much. You, you don't even know where you're going. Like you need to know you're going to the right spot. Yeah. Well, that's to me what I take away from what you just said about Sharon, right? I mean, there's probably very few people listening to this podcast right now that are shooting a lower power, lower weight, lower speed setup. And everybody obviously wants to be, you know, the biggest, strongest guy in the room with the, you know, oh, I'm shooting, you know, the strongest, this, that, and the other thing. But at the end of the day, shot placement. And I mean, here's another thing that I would just say, like, I don't think I'm a good enough hunter to be able to say, like, I can afford to only take shots inside of 27. Like, I simply am not good enough, right, to get that close to animals as often as I wish. But yeah. That I think speaks to not losing sight of the objective. The objective is to kill animals quickly and uh, without collateral damage. For and sure, yeah. That that, sure. that comes back down to then the the skill of of, of hunting. I mean, um, there's a, a good buddy of Justin Lee's. His name is Wayne. I actually gave him one of my old bows recently, um, and this dude. Like, you know, these guys that grew up in Hawaii, like they, it's hard to explain like how good they are at hunting. Oh, yeah. Because they live, they, they hunt every single day. Yeah. They hunt when they're walking to school, they're hunting with their bows. Yeah. They go to school, they come home, they're hunting with their bows. I, I, Wayne guided me on a hunt once. Like, I couldn't, he's an animal. He's, I mean, I say he's an animal. I mean, he literally understands where animals are. He knows what they do. He knows how yeah. they think. In one weekend in this one part of Maui that is almost, I would say it's some of the most difficult physical hunting I've ever done in my life, where you can go days and not see a deer, you know, or not, when I say not see, not get within shooting range of a deer, like you can't get within a hundred yards of a big buck. I think in two days, he killed six bucks. Like, dude, I mean, like yeah. the guy can sneak up on deer. Mm -hmm. And well, the more the you're archer? around stuff like that, yeah, yeah, you just, you start to read demeanor. And like you said, you actually start to become like them. You know, you really do. You know, that's, that is what happens. And especially when you have someone that's good at sealing the deal, you know, there's just, there's difference, but there's just, there's a difference between hunters and killers. There, 
there's really a difference. And so I love, mm. like, I welcome, I welcome debates with killers, but, um, with hunters that talk about hypotheticals that haven't like the only way, you know, hypotheticals is to be out there enough. And it's like, you have to see enough heads hit things and you have to see, you've had to have tracked an animal where someone's only shooting 30 pounds. You've got to, you know, you got to go out there and see what happens when people are missing arrows because the animals are gone before their arrows even get there. Like, you know, some of the people are saying, you know, I don't mind if my bow is only 240 feet a second. Well, there's animals I've hunted. Your arrow wouldn't be there. Like, and I'm talking at 30 yards, like Peter on a lot of the axis you encounter, if you were taking 30 yard shots. Yeah. I've learned the hard way with, with, there's the, a, with, there's the, a, with a six or 700 grain arrow. That's going, you know, 250 feet a second. It, like you actually do need to be thinking about a broadhead that's going to puncture through bone because you're not hit. You're not like at this point, you're not hitting vitals. You're hoping to hit hair. You're like saying, I think the animal will still be there in some way or another when my arrow gets there. Yeah. Well, certainly with axis deer, you, um, you have this situation where I think there's a, there's a suboptimal zone that's probably between <laughs> 25 and 45 yards i think it's further but yeah you there there's a mid-range that is extremely dangerous in bow hunting people don't like people don't appreciate that but for me anything over about 33 34 yards from there to 70 I honestly do way more contemplating on that shot than I would on anything sub 30 and anything from 70 and beyond 70 beyond the, the sound that goes off isn't within their danger zone. So they're more like, where did that sound come from? I'm just going to look at it and try to figure it out. But man, that 30 to, for me, the 30 to like 60 is just of everything needs to be in the right way for me to be comfortable on shots like that yeah they'll uh they'll they'll do things that seem to defy physics (laughs) (laughs) well dude this was a great combo i really really liked it i feel like i could just talk about this forever but the more you um the more autopsies you do, I think the better the podcast will get as well. Mm, well, hopefully we'll get a chance to do some autopsies this fall. <laughs> but that that head that you're choosing, dude, you could, you know, your son could build you a bow out of a broom handle and a bungee cord. And if you said, I really want to shoot something with this to make him happy, I'd be like, take the Cayuga, dude. <laughs> like some of those heads are just, you know, that kudu, the coyote, that iron will, they're going to penetrate amazing. They really are. It's just like you said, it just really boils down to that question of what do you, you know, if you're getting 10 inches, what do you want? Do you want that or do you want that? Yeah. Yeah. And so again, I, I don't remember the exact width of the Cayuga. I don't it might be one and three eighths. So you're basically saying I'm, I'm trading five eighths of an inch of potential. Injury. Well, I guess, I guess the, the, well, and they make art, a tri pen that goes out to two and a quarter now, don't they? I don't know. They normally cut two and a half or more just oh, okay. because they're driving high, because the expanding you know? slap. Yeah. 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 But, but here's the thing though, I guess, with those heads, you're not only going to get 10. So, I mean, I guess the argument is, you know, do you want that wide for that long? Or would you rather have that wide for that long? Because the same, you know, one's going to penetrate more. So technically you've got the length of what that extra penetration is, but it seems like, I don't know. It seems like when you're going into the vital area, it's kind of like 
if you're going into those those money vaults where you're like trying to just grab money that's like blowing <laughs> around <laughs> you know having some longer arms you would think would help just scoop stuff in so it's like you said when there's all these little bitty things that actually are fatal that you would never millimeters like there's certain things that a millimeter nick would be fatal so like yep. are you expanding your opportunity for that first 12 inches of that depth to hit any of those or do you have to go 20 inches to double down on that ability it's man it's just an endless thing i think you gotta honestly i think you have to go with what you know will penetrate enough to be vital you know and that's why like if someone ever said like hey here's a new expandable you know, for low poundage, you should let try, Sharon try it. I'd just be like, not happening. <laughs> I mean, I yeah, I don't even think I'd let her shoot an expandable on a turkey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this all to me just sounds, the easiest way to summarize this would be, um, A, there's no right answer. Uh, <laughs> B, the, the shooter matters. Uh, C, yeah. the equipment matters. D, the scenario, the hunting scenario matters, right? What's the animal? What's the angle? What's, you know, what's the collateral? All of these things matter. And I, I suppose ultimately what it comes down to is, can you get enough reps in so that you know in the moment which tool to use? Because yeah. that that's basically all it comes down to. I mean, this is a tactical discussion, but, um, you know, it comes down to understanding what are what are the what are the strategies by which each is successful i agree and and you know if and what i don't want is people to spend so much time trying to like tune you know trying to tune something that's tough to tune or you know spending more time on the equipment when the reality is like like you said having having the ability to like aim in the right place on just an instant silhouette where maybe you can't see a muscle definition. You can't see that, like having enough reps to where the subconscious motor skills executes, perfect shots, puts arrows with, within that kill radius. Cause I really think people are accurate enough to where if we talked about hitting that one particular spot, I think I think if everyone knew where to hold on where to aim on that and I and they were focusing on that, I think we would have way more double lungs. He went right down. You know, I missed this little spot, but now when yeah. you're you know, now when you're in a, a radius this big, heck, that thing's dying all the time anyway. But some some people haven't shot their own equipment enough because they keep changing it and changing it to where they're honestly just trying to get the silhouette and that's where I see things from a hunting point of view being problematic. You know, we have to be accurate first dead. We need to be snipers. We need to be able to, you know, aim top third of the top third of the kill zone and it's lights out or not. Like that should be our confidence level going into these things. And I think when people are, trying to dive too deep into the equipment realm i think we lose focus on what really matters the most and what is the absolute out of all this a double lung is an absolute it like, is uh, a media steinel shot is an absolute okay yeah. there's yeah. two absolutes and if you're not if you're not shooting a 10 inch group neither one of those are gonna happen so at that point we might as well get back into the broadhead debate <laughs> <laughs> well i'm gonna check out the video aim big miss small as soon as we hop off this and and you're gonna work on the uh the, the lighter. lighter drill yep okay yep. all right thanks brother. peter i appreciate it so much dude it was awesome it was awesome all right. be sure to check out knockonarchery.com for our full line of custom designed products as well as free in-depth education and bow hunting entertainment to help you shoot at your best.